hi everyone, it's Naomi Wolf here, and I'm so excited to be with Megan Barraket, who is joining us for the first time as a commentator with Daily Clout, um, the founder of One Girl and an advocate for young people. And I'm here with Suraj Patel, who is running to unseat Representative Carolyn Maloney in New York's uh, 12th district. And we're really excited to have you. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you for having Clout. me, absolutely. So why don't you just Sure. Right into it, Megan. Sure. So thank you for having us. Yeah, We're of here course. at your campaign office, which is very cool. We were just commenting how smoothly things are running here and has this very cool um, young vibe. Yep. And you have made a point of showcasing that you have 200 millennial volunteers. Yeah. What do you think drew them in? I think we are a really unique campaign from into our DNA. And the reason is because we didn't start with the premise that young people won't vote or Frankly, minorities won't vote, foreign events won't vote, register. You know, one thing that we um, started with is that normal politics, normal campaigns start with the premise that there are some people who are inherently high propensity voters. I don't think anyone's born with a gene that says, you know, you're going to likely go to the polls in November or June. I think that uh, the failure of our party as Democrats to really engage everybody is one of the things we're now dealing with with Donald Trump in the White House, that only 5% of the country voted for Donald Trump. 40% of people stayed at home. And in wow. this primary, historically, 93% of people don't even vote on June 26th next week uh, in, New in, York. in New York in the past, in this primary. And so we were like, well, if you're only going to engage the 7% of people who vote over and over and over, and that group is very misrepresentative, of New Yorkers mm. as a whole, mm -hmm. and you have representation that's misrepresented in the district. Really and you started the interview by saying, you know, Sarge Pell is trying to unseat Cal Malone. I don't look at it that way. Okay, I look at it as Sarge Pell is trying to represent New York 12, mm -hmm. the real New York 12, the real dynamic, diverse, aspirational city and district of this city. It's one of the most diverse districts in America. Really? Yeah. I mean, because it's it true. is the upper east side right but People have a lot of stereotypes about the and side. that's the thing so so we always think of New York as the upper east side and wow that's a significant and important part of our district it's also midtown east lower east side east village gramercy chelsea uh midtown um really? great green point wow. green point Super williamsburg yeah. long island city astoria right. blissville and roosevelt island it's so bizarre that Some all these of years most, I've thought of it as the upper east side. And maybe and, that's what I, I mean. Saw him and, and that's what I mean, right? Our representation is misrepresented right. of the actual district. So so starting from day one, you know, we engaged young people and everybody, frankly, all 100% of this district uh, by, you know, um, promoting content to them that explains what the election is, what Congress does. We didn't start with any preconceived notions mm -hmm. that some people didn't care. We started with the, with the notion that some people just didn't know, mm -hmm. that most people don't know. And you can see it in the way we're conducting our campaign. Uh, yes, one, so. one campaign in this race is narrow cast, right? It's sending mail to the same 30,000 or so people that are, they've coded as likely voters mm -hmm. based on, simply on past behavior, right? They voted over and over in the past. And all they do is send mail when they do not want to broadcast the election to anybody else mm -hmm. because low turnout benefits them. And sending the same sort of Bed Bath & Beyond looking mailer week after week after week will turn out those same people, but never engage everybody else. Mm -hmm. We started the opposite way. Uh, I know you guys were yeah, remarking on these coffee cups. Let's, let's show, Megan, we want to show your coffee cup. Yeah. This is not an endorsement, just like... No, no, cover. just we're just drinking from them because you're in our office. <laughs> right. uh, but but uh, these coffee cups are, there are 200,000 of them right now wow. being handed out across 50 coffee carts within all three boroughs of the district and Roosevelt mm Islands. -hmm. There have been six coffee carts with our insignia on them for the last couple months, mm -hmm. registering voters, new voters. Wow. We're doing what New You're York City- registering City's, voters from coffee carts? Yeah. It's pretty We're doing what New York City should have done itself decades ago. Right. New York is consistently below 40th in turnout mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to elections and has some of the most voter suppressive laws in the country. Wow. Now, who does that benefit? That benefits an insular, uh, machine and the incumbents it protects, and it keeps out competition and new voices. And it's because of that that there's almost a stagnation in uh, our representation and our politics and our policies. No one's leading. And that brings me to the reason I'm running. Okay. In almost every facet of American life, New York City and this district particularly leads in media and technology, entertainment and finance, culture, mm -hmm. and 
yet for whatever reason we have been satisfied or stuck with a complacent status quo that is okay with the apathy of seven percent uh, of the district coming out. Okay, so let me jump in there because Megan has a question about gender. Yeah, yes. yeah. So in this era, the Me Too era, and where women really want their issues to be heard, um, how do you, as a man, um, feel about potentially unseating a a powerful female? Um, look, I you know I'm a huge supporter of the Me Too movement, and I'm a huge supporter of more women in office. Um, and and you know an organization that I helped co-found last year called the Arena to support uh, many many more women candidates than men, all trying to get the representation gap filled. And that being said, this isn't just about that. I think there ought to be more women in office. There should be more people of color in office. There should be more first-generation Americans like myself in office. There should be um, a lot more people in office. But most important, we need effective representation. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is I just don't think that our current representative is effective. How so? Relative I mean, to... So let me challenge you a little bit on that. Sure. Because I, I follow Representative Maloney closely. She's been good enough to invite Daily Cup to a number of, of her events. Um, not that we endorse them. Uh, she has a really strong feminist record. She supported the ERA. She passed. Or she I, I'm, a, I'm, I, I, I'm a proud supporter of the ERA as well. I want to make that clear. That's good. Um, she uh, proposed a bill that I think was very creative uh, to ensure that boards, corporate boards, were transparent about their gender representation. And she um, has been fighting hard for Fearless Girl, you know, the statue that represents uh, equality in the financial district, which is symbolic, but also not symbolic. She's also been a champion of the Women's History Museum in DC. So a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people love Carolyn Maloney, and they're looking at you, and they may be thinking, you know, a critic might say, Carolyn Maloney is kind of doing a good job on a lot of issues that matter to New Yorkers. What what can you offer that can balance out losing a strong feminist in Congress? Sure. Look. Or well, you may be a strong feminist, but a strong female feminist in Congress. Yeah, and, and I am a strong feminist. And I do believe that, um, that, that again, I'm a supporter of the ERA, but I'm also a supporter. Look, I teach business at Dixon and Lowe. My mom uh, you know, is the founder of a company. She's a CFO. She's a woman of color and an immigrant. I know how difficult it is to access capital uh, for women. And, uh, women both, particularly in this country, and as a you know, only five percent of venture capital dollars went to female right. founded companies last right. year. So there is a lot of substantive issues there that that I'm going to fiercely advocate for on behalf of women and Can all the other. Some, I mean, well, so that's one, right? So equal pay, the ERA, um, you know, access to capital and loans, which is a huge How thing. How do you legislate that? You can let so so uh, board equity. You mentioned is something that I'm a huge proponent of. Um, equal pay legislation, I'm a huge proponent of. But, uh, and then, uh, you know, paid family leave yeah. and, and reproductive justice issues, again, huge proponent of as well. What I so guess we're not I'm losing saying, a feminist. You're not losing a feminist at all. Is what what I am saying, though, is it's been a decade since the congresswoman has passed a substantive piece of legislation. Ouch. Ouch. Is that true? It has been since what, because you note that she will consistently talk about, you know, a 2009 bill or a 2001 bill or whatever. It's 2018, guys. Um, you really want to stand by that statement that it's been a decade since Carolyn Maloney has passed a substantive, substantive piece? piece of um, almost a decade since a, a truly substantive piece of legislation. She'll fact check that. Sure, <laughs> please do. Please do. Um, and co sponsoring and uh, bills, your point that she'll always say, but look, signing your name onto a bill someone else wrote is not, to me, the kind of leadership we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But there are substantive differences in this race, mm -hmm. significant ones. Okay. You know, um, I would not have voted for the Iraq war and most certainly against the Iran deal. And this city and it, this district is not a pro-war district. Mm -hmm. But in the two biggest foreign policy decisions of my lifetime and, and frankly hers, she said it with George W. Bush and Donald J. Trump mm -hmm. over Barack Obama. And only after getting a primary challenger, you know, did she say, okay, I support the Iran deal. Similarly. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge proponent of science and evidence-based policy. It's really sad that we have to even make that kind of statement today in 2018, but Donald Trump and, and Republicans often question science and attack scientists and climate change is something that we're not gonna fix without, uh, without elevating those places. But for almost two decades, nine uh, anti-vaccine bills she sponsored, she's on the back cover book called The Autistic Holocaust. You cannot be in this district, which is 81% college educated, 
uh, you cannot be feeding echo chambers with pseudoscience and, and, and sort of uh, having that chilling effect on the number of vaccines given in the city. So, so I mean, that's a huge issue to me. There's some, some I, other... I, I mean, I hear you. I, I wouldn't say vaccination is in the top 10 issues facing New Yorkers, but I hear you. We do, we do have a, a huge issue with people working sex industry, and we have a huge mm-hmm. issue with the drug war. So you've got a question about the sex well, industry. I was wondering if you can explain a little bit to our viewers what um, sexta pasta yes. means. Yeah, yeah, of course. So to, to your viewers and to myself, I did not know what sexta pasta mm-hmm. were either. Uh, I still don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so SESTA is a bill that is ostensibly made to stop um, sex trafficking by cutting off websites mm-hmm. that uh, advertise for uh, or that, that allow sex workers to, um, you know, advertise. And what we found out, so after we launched this campaign, we started getting lots and lots of women, men, gender nonconforming individuals. This is an issue that's very, very important to trans women uh, approaching us and saying, what's your position on SESTA? Wow. We just started, I mean, honestly, like it was the most organic thing. We're doing what I think Congress ought to do, right. which is listen to the affected parties of laws we're about to make Certainly. instead of lock them out of the process. So what is SESTA? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the bill basically uh, imposes liability on platforms that engage mm-hmm. in... Uh, you know, the selling of sex work. That's going to chill free speech. It does. It shut down lots of websites. ACLU was opposed to it. The Electronic Frontier Foundation was opposed to it. Most importantly, though, two bigger, uh, two big things. The largest network of anti-trafficking survivors in this country were opposed to it. Wow. And the, and the Trump, Why? Trump, I'll tell you, and the Trump's Department of Justice itself was opposed to it because it makes, and both of us, it makes the prosecution an evidentiary burden of finding who's ex, uh, who's engaged in sex trafficking significantly more difficult. By pushing this stuff to the dark web, by pushing this stuff back on the streets, women primarily, but, but, uh, but like I said, again, gender non-conforming, I did this not, not just a women's issue, um, are really being hurt. Right. And we started getting all these emails and phone calls and, and texts and all that, or uh, tweets. And so my amazing policy director, I said, I said well, let's examine it, let's figure it out. Sort of, this is a risky thing to talk about, yeah. yeah. But it's the right thing to do if we're not going to protect the most marginalized among us from cities like this, from districts like this, and who will? Mm-hmm. And so, we went through seven iterations of this like 11 page white paper that we sent to every single group pro and against mm-hmm. about how we could fix SESTA FOSTA to, to target sex trafficking mm-hmm. but not put. Uh, you know, sex workers or people engaged, and that's a broad industry, by the way. And that's one thing we have to work on really is destigmatizing sex work. Mm-hmm. Right. Is there are people you out there? I believe you're running for Congress and you're out front with such a daring position. And that's exactly what we ought to be doing for places like this, right? right. That um, you can be, you know, tough on crime mm-hmm. everywhere mm-hmm. in this country because it's easy for you to win elections that way, but it's not the right thing to do. We want to be smart on crime. We want to focus on prevention. So what are you going to do, uh, you, say you're elected, what are you going to do to follow up on Megan's question with SESTA FOSTA? Yeah, so I mean. And how will we protect women and children who are being trafficked? Absolutely. So, so, so yeah. the, you know, I was an intern at Senator Dianne Feinstein's office in 2000 when we passed, when, we, when she was working on the TVP, the Trafficking and Victim Protection Act. And that act um, should be our key, uh, you know, legislative vehicle to strengthen anti-trafficking procedures. See, trafficking, stopping trafficking needs to attack at the root causes of trafficking, which is exploitation, which is lack of economic opportunity, uh, and when oftentimes undocumented status. Because it is the lack of having documentation that stops you from going to police, stops you from being right. able to call this stuff out. Right. And in the TVPA, you can get, a, 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 you can you know, turn yourself in as a traffic sex worker or oh, traffic person, wow. but you have to prove Severe traffic. Oh no! And and the reason that they you can't that, just say I'm being trafficked. And the reason is help? because now you're seeing it every day. The same people who passed this law, uh, the SESTA, are more opposed to getting a, a extra undocumented people showing up and saying we're mm-hmm. a victim mm-hmm. than they are about that's stopping issue. traffic. I hear what you're saying. And that, to me, is the core crux of this. Mm-hmm. And Democrats fell for this. Right. You see, one thing that we run on, and I run on in this district is really talking about 
generational things that are major differences between the last generation Democrats and this one. Mm -hmm. Triangulating Democrats and the end of triangulation. Could you explain what the, that means? The, right, yeah, of course, of course. So the last generation Democrats really fell for being tough on crime, passed mandatory minimum laws, continued to fail. Explain what a mandatory minimum Oh, sorry. So in 1994, Congress, including uh, Congressman Maloney, um, passed uh, the 1994 crime bill, to which which expanded mandatory minimums, which means judges that would otherwise have the discretion to say, oh, you you know you have a marijuana offense, I'm gonna let you go, or I'm gonna give you probation, or I'm gonna whatever. The law makes it that they have to impose a sentence of X number of years, days, whatever, mm -hmm. based on a massive metric, mm -hmm. and it takes away discretion on that, and it creates we now in this country. Mm -hmm have 25% of the world's prison population. Wow. We're only 5% of the world's population. And so that imbalance has been a long-term trend. 1996, we passed in that same Congress and with, with, with the Congresswoman's support, the Immigration Reform Act, which created the precursor for ICE, which created fast-track deportation and lack of due process. And so my point with the sesta fossa thing was, yet again, if you are a hammer, everything you see is a nail. Right. You are going to, um, uh, Create new categories so of then are you going to propose a bill to make it easier for trafficked people to turn themselves in? Absolutely. We ought to amend the TVPA to do that. We ought to also really, if we're going to tackle trafficking as, as uh, sex trafficking, um, you know, is a huge issue, mm -hmm. but labor trafficking, domestic service, uh, migrant, uh, agricultural workers, those three compose 80% of trafficking. We need to talk, let's talk about all of it. Okay. So, you have this giant holistic brain for policy, mm -hmm. and it's it's exciting to listen to, but it also raises so many questions. I've just been told that we have only three minutes left. Did you have a burning last question, Megan? Mm -hmm. Do you, unless you have something? I do. Uh, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a tough one, but um, your uh, opponent, Carolyn Maloney, um, points out that most of the donations, or she says this, uh, to your campaign are from outside the U.S., and she says, quote, I No, they're not outside the no, U.S., it's illegal. I thought it was illegal. Uh, a huge amount are in the name of Patel. So even if I, you know, that's the only part of the quote that's accurate, I'm going to throw on the set of caution. What do you say to that? Is that racist? Is it not racist? Is it um, legitimate criticism? What does it mean? Is I certainly it don't think it's legitimate criticism. I think that in the history of the United States, so many times ethnic groups that are, that lack representation, you know, this was the, was the Irish, you know, Smith mm -hmm. or the Kennedys or whatever, that there has been a huge amount of ethnic pride in supporting mm -hmm. people who represent you as right. you come of age in this yeah. country. Yeah. But tell us, there are 300,000 of us. I was going to say, it's, a, and it's we're like, not... there are a lot of O'Shea's. Right? Yeah. There are a lot of yeah, Smith's. Yeah, I would be like, what if I said that a lot of your donations come from people with yeah, O'Shea's? Do you know like dog medicine? Is that like radio? Yes, I kind of think so. And at first I was like, no, nah, she just messed up. And then I realized like, she's taken thousands of dollars from Patel over the last, over her 25 years. Right. We're big time though. I mean, if someone said a lot of your supporters are Cohen's, I would Ooh. have a problem with yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think that was really uh, distasteful and a bit dog whistly. But she knows, you know, what she did. Um, that being said, look, we don't take corporate PAC money. Really? I do not take a dime from corporations. Every dollar that we've raised is from a living, breathing human being. Are you willing to say how much you've raised? Uh, approximately one point to 1.3 million dollars that's kind of amazing from living you're breathing not taking, yeah I mean, that's pretty and, extraordinary. and so she and and she does and one of those things that as a lawyer i would say that and an ethics professor that if you want to overturn citizens united mm -hmm. then and you say that you want to mm -hmm. but then you turn around and take corporate PAC money mm -hmm. from in the same district you know and from primarily from wall street mm -hmm. that you regulate and republicans call us hypocrites no guys it's like we are so I don't take corporate PAC money. Um, she does, and and I think that's a huge point of contention in this race. Right. Well, wow, well, that's a very strong mm -hmm. note to end on. I, I hate to stop because I, I I you know if you, if I can ever come back with you, you can definitely get me back. I would love to talk Absolutely. about climate change because I was told by I want to talk about climate change. I love talking about climate change. <laughs> this uh, this but your, uh, your lovely campaign manager is not allowing us to do it now. I think so we can do we it have that other interview. Sorry. Right. Yeah. But listen, happy to do it again. And right. and after we win, I'll have all the time in the world to talk to you guys um a little more. Very fascinating. Slowly. Very very. Thank you so much for making time. Thank for you so Siraj much for Patel. coming down. And sorry. Yeah. Being so, so, so Roger Patel, listen, he's running, it's a primary, which is June 26th. That's if right. If you live in New York, 
if you live in his district, which you can see on his website, there's a map, right? Really yep. helpful. You might not even know you live in his district. What if you've never voted before? What do our what do our audience members need to know to vote for you if they want to, or vote for your opponent in the primary? You just need to remember that June 26 is this primary. It is in the summer. It is a very low turnout primary because no one really uh, broadcasts it, but we are. And if you're a registered Democrat, uh, you can vote in this primary in the same polling place that you voted last fall. And um, tomorrow, actually, is the deadline to turn in an absentee ballot request form. So if you can go oh, to the state DOE site and uh, a board election site, print that out, mail it in by tomorrow, right. and you can still get the ballot in the mail this week, turn it in, so and get done with your civic duty. I'm just going to say uh, we found that making the absentee ballot available really helped turn out of um, people of color because at least in the South they were being mm -hmm. harassed at the polls. So we at Daily Cloud will send you that website. We'll post it on our blog so you can do the absentee ballot if you prefer. We can't thank you enough. Come down mm -hmm. here to 64 Cooper Square. Cooper Square. You can get condoms with Siraj's name on it. You can on get nail wrapper. art on the wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> You can, sure get that... art and you can get these awesome um, cups and a bunch of other really cool stuff, as well as possibly a representative who will represent your interests. We are nonpartisan, but we're really happy to have you. Thank you to your lovely team. And this is Naomi Wolf, Megan Barrett, Siraj Patel, and we are with Daily Five.